coming up on Garden Talk. So if your plant's kind of weak and you're trying to train some of your plants and get better growth, you go to train it and it snaps instead of just kind of bending. Well, that's because a lot of it might be not enough silica that your plants are getting or using or in available form. The chelation's a multi valent ion with the cation exchange. It's another one of those cation exchanges that it can chelate and change some of the multivalent bonds, ion bonds, and help with different plants to chelate different nutrients or to lock things out. Enzymes are what help with how plants express themselves, how they use nitrogen. You know, as a newbie, keeping it simple, I can grab a couple boxes of a couple ingredients that have some beneficial biology and some good nutrients and start with that. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This is episode number 13. In this episode, I interview Medically Fit. He is a YouTuber that has over 18,000 subscribers, and he's been creating gardening content since 2013. He has been gardening for 10 years now, and he grows vegetables, medicinal, and houseplants. In this episode, we talk about 10 different dry amendments that you can use in your garden. There are so many different amendments out there that can be used. We just cover a short list today. We talk about what the amendments are, what the benefits are, and application rates. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. If you're listening on one of the podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. If you're liking these episodes and you want to support even more, you can do that through Patreon. The link to that is patreon.com slash mrgrowit. I'll leave a link to my Patreon down in the description section below for those of you who are viewing on YouTube. That being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let's just get into it. All right, Medically Fit, welcome to Garden Talk. How are you doing? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm super excited to have you on, dude. I've actually been following your channel since like 2013. So you were like one of the first people that I've actually started watching. So I'm like fanboying it out a little bit. Nice. <laughs> you that's, <on> here. <laughs> that's interesting to me because I didn't really know that you were kind of a fan of mine. And so it's really nice to know that, you know. You were one of the people who actually like, I think you were one of the first people to actually nudge me over to the organic side of things. I remember you like came onto my live stream one time and I was like checking the pH of the runoff and you're like, why do you check the pH? Like, With organics, you don't have to. And you're like, come over to my world, you know, come over to my... <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, you were definitely an inspiration for me to kind of transitioning over. I mean, the, the amount of knowledge that you have on the organic side of thing is something I admire. So I'm super excited to have you on the show today. But, um, well, thanks for having me. Very glad to be here. Cool. Um, so for those that don't know who you are, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into growing? Well, um, I've been a cultivator since 2011, 12-ish. Um, started kind of learning uh, when I lived in Las Vegas. Um, back then, I wanted to know about cultivating vegetables and medicinal you know, uh, plants for uh, me. And Nevada was a medical state, so I could. So I really wanted to kind of know, and that's what got me into it. Um, what kind of pushed me even harder is I lost my father. And like being around plants and just growing really helped because I didn't have like the cognitive skills and understand how to deal with that type of loss in my life. And it really helped me deal with how to get through the loss because I was able to get in and kind of take care of things. and like just sit there and be with the plants and it was nice and so medicinal plants you have any fruits veggies are you indoors outdoors or what um i do like summertime we try to get our garden going so we'll do vegetable crops um squash tomatoes peppers um i try to do some other like mints and herbs um for in the house outdoor uh, we do some medicinal plants. Uh, we just recently moved to Pueblo area. It's kind of harder to do it here. The heat, um, it's really dry. It's sometimes almost just as bad as living in Las Vegas. Um, but I do a lot more indoor if uh, possible. Um, it's easier to control some of my environment conditions. I can grow year round instead of just through the summer and spring seasons. Um, 
Down here in Pueblo, we have a little bit later fall, so I can get a little bit later crop outdoors if I need to uh, for some of my vegetables. So kind of a little bit of both, really. Nice, nice. Cool. All right, so let's get into the topic today. So we're going to talk all about dry amendments. So there are so many different dry amendments that can be incorporated in your garden, right? Dozens of different amendments. We're not going to be able to talk about all of them today, uh, unfortunately. We'll talk about a handful of them. Uh, but you have a whole wealth of knowledge in regards to a lot of these amendments, and that's really what I want to pick your brain on today. I watched your video that you have on dry nutrient tea, so your nutrient tea video, and this kind of inspired the questions that I have for you today. I basically have a list of amendments that we're going to go over for him, and I have a feeling that a lot of my viewers aren't even going to like be aware of these amendments, so um, I guess this would probably be, maybe be like a more intermediate slash advanced type topic you know because a lot of these things that we talk about they're they're not used in a lot of um normal not used application gardening yeah. settings like some of the amendments that i use most people don't use in their garden settings i do it for a specific reason and most of my reason is everything that i've been learning and understanding from of the self-taught education growing up in Iowa around farmers trying to learn you know understand cultivation it's about diversity and so I try to use a vast variety of different dry organic amendments and most people are like oh that's a lot well I don't know what the plant wants or needs I try to give it everything possible that makes sense. So let's just get right into it then. Let's uh, let's start okay. with gypsum. So that's one of the things that you incorporate in. Uh, so talk to us about gypsum. What, you know, what are the benefits? How do you apply it? So on and so forth. Well, gypsum is it's a calcium uh, and a sulfur kind of powder. Um, it's really water soluble. Uh, it works great for a lot of people find that their plants or soil are like calcium deficient or the plants have a little bit of calcium deficient. This is pretty high amendment, like 22% calcium and like 17% sulfur in some of this. So it's pretty high. Um, there's several different ways you can mix it in. I do a tea. I will mix it in a super soil mix when I'm trying to make like a soil to grow in. So there's a couple different applications. Um, a lot of people really just do it more as a top feeding or a soil, you know, like a uh, super soil, like I was saying, or a tea, um, just from the solubility. Uh, kind of repeat myself a little bit, sorry. Um, some of it also helps with like root growth, nutri nutrient uptake, uh, cation exchange. Uh, calcium really does a lot for the plant. And this is part of what we're trying to do is get the plant these available nutrients. Gypsum has calcium, sulfur readily available to it. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, a lot of what really I found very interesting because a lot of people are concerned with some of my soil mixes being high in heavy metals. Well, gypsum actually helps to reduce some of these heavy metal toxins from manganese to boron to aluminum. It kind of binds it up so the plant can't uptake it. And so when a lot of people are concerned about like using trace minerals, trace minerals like azomite that we're going to talk about, that's one of them that kind of has some higher heavy metals to it, but this will help prevent those heavy metals from being uptaken in the plant. So it's really interesting. Um, it helps with soil structure, runoff, um, kind of helps retain water a little bit instead of allowing it to run off. Um, balances the pH, kind of like what dolomite lime can do. Uh, real similar, but it's actually, to me, um, and if quite a few other people, gypsum's better than dolomite lime in some ways. So there's a lot of really interesting information that comes with just gypsum itself. I know you use the down-to-earth gypsum 
Um, yes. When we talk about application rates, I, mean, I know you said you can use it as like a, do, a rich, uh, soil conditioner, also as a top rest. Do you know the application rates off the top of your head or just refer to the box? Um, I do and I don't. So I'll give it to you in a two-part deal. Okay. Depending on the size of pot, gallon, to bale, like my measurements that I have already on like some of my super soil, it's made out for a bale. So it can be anywhere from a cup and a half to six cups, just depending on how much you're really trying to add to it. If you're trying to make it in a super soil in a five gallon pot, it's like two tablespoons, three tablespoons. So it, it really varies on each of these, um, depending on per gallon, per pot, or the amount of soil you're trying to make. So I can give you, you know, kind of a just answer, but I'm assuming that most of your audience are going to make different um, sizes of this when they go to use some of it. So really look on the box, see what they recommend. Down to Earth has um, on their website, kind of tells you a little bit. You can also Google and some of them do tell a little different application rates. Um, so kind of just do a little research to see what you, what you like. I play around a little bit when I add it. Sometimes I add more of it, sometimes I add less of it. I kind of see what my plant is wanting and what's needing. So it's not quite dialed in, but I, I still play with my recipe a little bit. So, Gotcha. Azomite, you mentioned azomite uh, briefly. Let's talk about that. What is azomite? What are the benefits? How do you apply it? Azomite is a very interesting deal. It's rock dust. That's from ancient volcanoes that it's harvested. This is where we talk about some of the heavier minerals being in the, in the, the dirt itself because of everything that's coming up from the volcano. Aluminum, magnesium, copper, lead, like arsenic, heavy toxin metals. But it's not so high that I'm concerned because most of the benefits of trace minerals you as humans, or we as humans, and our plants both need trace minerals for major f and hormonal functions within the plant. So believe it or not, the plant does need lead, it does need arsenic, it does need copper, zinc, boron, aluminum. Not in such high doses, but they need it for major and minor functions of how we act, how different chemicals are sent you know, through our body, through the plant, different hormones. So this really helps the plant basically be in a homeostasis. So if we can get the all the trace uh, macro, micro nutrients, that's kind of what rock dust azomite is doing, is giving us that whole variety of all these different trace minerals that we don't get from other uh, fertilizers or amendments. And with that uh, same thing, is soil amend the soil to begin with and also as a top dress, or what, what would you recommend? I do it. Um, I'll add it to both my teas, one for veg, one for flour. Um, just depending on the cycle, I still add it. I do add it to my soil amendments. Um, when I'm doing a top dress, I don't do so much of a top dress with it because that's where most of my teas and I'm trying to get some of the solubility. If I think I'm having issues, then I'm looking more at my super soil recipe that I made instead of looking at like, okay, what's going on with my plant? Is it because I'm not getting trace minerals? Most of the time I don't have deficiencies with trace minerals just because um, I add more than most because I don't know how much the plant actually needs, and it needs different minerals at different times of its cycle. So if I can get the variety and let the biology and the soil kind of do what it does, the plant will regulate when it wants it, when it needs it, and I just kind of sit back. Rock phosphate, what is it? What are the benefits? How do you apply it? Rock phosphate is really interesting because at first <clears throat> I used to use um, I'm trying to remember. It's bottle of B vitamins. Um, it's like plant hormones. So rock phosphate is kind of doing that. It's a phosphorus. Um, 
that's like the B vitamin complex that the plant needs for energy, for uh, different functions like uh, nutrient fix or nitrogen fixation where the plant will take different types of nitrogen and change it to usable forms. Um, it's something that it helps with photosynthesis that plants really photosynthesis is key. It, it helps the energy, the ATP and how the plant uses energy to create its sugars, produces its flowers, you know, and with its growth. So that's kind of what this rock phosphate is, is that B complex energy that helps overall with plant growth. How do you usually use it? Um, this is, it comes a couple different ways. It comes granular or powder. So most of the time I'll mix it in a tea, try to get the solubility of it. Not all of it's soluble. Um, so that's when, if I'm trying to amend the soil, I'll just take that and put it in the soil to kind of help amend it. Um, same thing, super soil. Um, if I'm making a bale, um, I'll probably use three cups for one cubic bale. So if I was doing like a five gallon pot, maybe like three tablespoons, not teaspoons, tablespoons, because most of it is in tablespoons. Um, it's pretty interesting. Don't see much of their nutrients or um, their line or any dry amendment really using teaspoons, unless you're really doing like a hydroponic setup or something along that line. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, rock phosphate and some of these other amendments some are going to take longer to break down, right? Those microbes that are breaking down those nutrients. Is rock phosphate one of the ones that take longer? Like I've heard on some of these amendments that it takes, it can take a year to potentially break down. Well, that's like green sand, for instance. And we'll kind of talk about that later. But green sand is one of them that literally takes 12 to 14 months before it really gets available. So yes, some of this takes a while to get <clears throat> and become available. There are different breakdown, um, how do I want to say it? Some of it is quick, some of it may take a few weeks, some of it may take a few months, depends on the biology, um, what the plant's really asking for. So it, it, it varies on what's really happening in your root zone with the biology, because that's gonna be a big thing. That's why a lot of times when I'm making teas, I'm looking for that solubility of it where it's readily available. Almost like I'm creating a bottle nutrient, getting that solubility ready and then feeding it to my plant. Got it. And when you're talking about solubility, you're talking about basically turning it into a plant available form. Correct. A liquid form where it, it takes some of that nutrients and gets it to where it's soluble in a liquid form. As in insoluble means it's not able to break down through water. Cool. How about uh, langbanite? Talk to us Lang about that. Langbanite, it's pretty interesting because it's pretty much potash. It's pretty much uh, potassium, a little bit of magnesium and sulfur. Um, it's one of those that I put in my soil mixes when I'm mixing my super soil. But when it comes to my teas... I try to use it more for flower when my plants are ready to go to produce their fruit. When they're flowering, when they're ready to just try to get more uh, flower development, it's one thing that I'll really kind of use. It's all soluble. It's kind of like a salt, but it, when it hits water, it will dissolve basically in the water. It helps with chlorophyll within the plant to help get chlorophyll because we didn't plants need it to kind of help with photosynthesis. So that's one thing that's kind of key about using some of this potash or this langmanite is it only not only helps with that, but it helps with like the sulfur part of it helps with enzyme um, activation. So it kind of helps some of the enzymes, the proteins in the plant kind of being able to be broke down and used. And that's kind of like important because enzymes are what help with how plants express themselves, how they use nitrogen, how they kind of develop. So it's really interesting on how some of like these simple dry amendments really work 
on different cellular levels of the plant and we don't really realize that just using them. How often do you apply it? Do you do a top dressing at all or just a soil conditioner? Uh, more of a soil conditioner. Um, if I wanted to do a top dressing because it's water soluble, it would break down pretty quickly. I'd probably use it in the beginning stages of flower and fruit. Um, like if I was flipping like say my medicinal plants and I would put it in like maybe two weeks before they really went in the flower because then it's letting the plant kind of know, hey, things are happening, things are changing, you know, we're getting different nutrients and it, it's kind of weird how people will kind of help the plant along doing things before you really put it into those cycles. And that's kind of one of them. That would be something I would do. Dolomite lime. So I think that's probably one of them that a lot of people have heard of. It's pretty common. Uh, talk to us about that. A lot of people use dolomite lime for soil conditioning. Um, a lot of people that have acidic soil, dolomite lime helps really buffer and brings up the acidity level to more of a neutral. And so if you're growing blueberries, you want more acidic soil. So you really don't want some of this dolomite lime. But if you're growing plants that certain crops that more want your pH to be around 6 to 7 and your soil or your water is like a 4, this dolomite lime is going to help balance it out as it's kind of breaking down over time. Um, it's high in calcium, just like the gypsum. That's why I try to use both of them. There are two different forms of calcium. And I'm letting the biology kind of break it down and the plant take it up and however, you know, it's, it's going to be available for it. Um, the dolomite lime also has magnesium. So when a lot of people are like, oh, I'm having cow mag problems. Well, I don't quite have that using dolomite lime. There's so much magnesium to it that I shouldn't be having any issues. And if I am, it's because it's not in a form that my plant's able to take it up. Now, follow-up question on this one. Say, hypothetical. Say you have a, a grower who's using synthetic nutrients. He gets himself into a bind. Maybe he checks his runoff pH, realizes it's in like the low fives, needs to increase that pH, wants to utilize dolomite lime to do that. Would you recommend that? And then how long would it take to actually adjust up that much? See, that's a good question because I haven't really tried that to see what the solubility is going to do with pH. So me adding it to uh, a hydroponic, I don't know how fast the pH is going to raise in it or how much I'm going to have to use for the setup. Because if I have a small setup, it may be like a tablespoon or a teaspoon. But if I have, say, 10 buckets that I'm running like a DWC or hydroponic setup, it may take a quarter cup. Gotcha. Okay. So no clear answer on that one. No, not really. Cause I don't, I would, I don't play with that enough to really say, Hey, if you use it in this fashion, this is your, what your results are going to be. Okay. Oyster shell. Talk to us about that. That's another great calcium product. Like I don't ever really seem to have problems with calcium in my soil because I have so many different variances of getting it in. Oyster shell helps strengthen the calcium. This is where it comes back to the calcium again. It helps strengthen cell walls. It helps with different enzymes, um, the production in the soil. Um, the, the shells also give the biology in your roots or in the soil like surface area to live off and build colonies. Um, oyster shell, it's not talked about a lot, but it's, it's almost like crab shell. It, it can have some chitinase to it, I believe, but nobody's really talking about it and I haven't seen it, but they're the similar product. It's a silica based, carbon based type shell that to me would have almost like chitin what crab shell does, but I'm not positive on it. I haven't seen a lot of information on that. And so this can be used, soil conditioner, can be used as a top dress. All of these can really be used kind of the same fashion. Is that correct? Yes and no. There's some products that are more soluble 
than others. So when it comes to making teas, some of the products are going to release more of a solubility it, it, because that's it. They're more soluble. Others are not. So if you're trying to make a tea with, say, oyster shell, it may have to sit a little longer to break down to get some of the solubility out of it. As where the langbanite, it may sit in there 20 minutes and already be dissolved and ready to use. So it does come back to, once again, some of the breakdown of the solubility of these products. If you're going to make a tea, you have to wait for it. If you're going to do a top dress or amend the soil with it, you can put it right in and let the soil cook and do what it's going to do and use it in a couple, 30 days or so. That makes sense. How long do you usually brew your teas? Um, 24 to 48 hours. Okay. Most of them depend on the temperature and what I'm really trying to get in my microbe community and how large of a community I'm trying to build. If I'm trying to water a lot of plants, I may do more of a heavier tea where I dilute it a little bit more after it's been brewing. That way I can disperse it out and have a higher count to my watering. Sometimes I'll just do a smaller dosage where I'm like 24 hours, just get a little bit in the water and then apply it to my plants and my soil. Green sand, let's talk about it. What is it? It's basically silica. It's a, it's trace minerals like iron, manganese. Um, it's, how do I want to say it? It's really different because a lot of like the green sand that I get is from glacier rock area where it's really been pounded and all these trace minerals from being ground for however long these glaciers took to move across the continent. A lot of it's really fine particles, almost like uh, sand, like sand, but it's more minerals and not so much sand. So it's like if you went to the beach, all the sand that you see, um, it's going to be a little different than what green sand is. Even though it has some trace minerals to it, green sand is going to be a little bit higher because it's like an iron content, um, potash. It has like cation exchange um, where it helps pull up nutrients from the soil where like calcium is one of those things that helps with cation exchange where it helps certain nutrients be taken up um, through an ion exchange and that's kind of the same thing of what people try to do with bottled nutrients is they try to create that cation exchange where it's being pulled up with all these ions and that's similar to what green sand is going to kind of do, but it's in an organic sense. It's straight silica. Silica also helps with like the strengthening of cell walls just as well. So if your plant's kind of weak and you're trying to train some of your plants and get better growth, you got to train it and it snaps instead of just kind of bending. Well, that's because a lot of it might be not enough silica that your plants are getting or using or in available form because silica comes in several different forms from using like horsetail horsetail is a, another natural product for silica but that has to take time to break down just like green sand it's one of those that's the 12 to 14 month time to break down so even if i'm trying to use it now it's not going to work because like medicinal users, they plant it, pot it, four months later, it's done. Vegetable gardens, plant it, pot it, produce, done. Well, this is something that you want to use more in like a no-till setup where it has time to break down and actually be in the soil, help really build the structure in it. It's funny, did you say cation exchange? And I, uh, I just filmed a podcast episode and uh, it was released, well, it would be released last week, and I pronounced the Cation Exchange, and that's the improper way, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hear it in the comment <laughs> section, I know that. Well, here's what's <laughs> funny. When you look at how it's spelled, it's C-A-T-I-O-N. 
So yep. you would yep. think that just looking at it, but until you've heard it a few times to recognize and go, oh, that's cat ion. Yeah. Just like uh, chelating, right? Chelating, yep. it looks like it's chelating. It's spelled chelating. Yes, so. it's C-H. <laughs> but anyways. Um, okay, cool. Uh, how about granular humic acids? Let's talk about those. Humic acids are one of those things that it's created over a long period of time. It, there's fulvic and humic acid. Both are kind of takes a long time to develop. And humic acid comes from like Leonard, Leonardite slate. It's from a slate, almost like a clay material. Have you ever seen slate walking around like beaches or um, – like around the Great Lakes, Midwest, there's a lot of slate uh, along the riverbed area. So it's pretty interesting. It just, it's real, it's like a rock, but it's so thin and it's so slippery that it's weird because slate, the, what is it, this product is made from, it actually helps to chelate different heavy metals. It's very weird what humic acid does. And it actually can detoxify heavy minerals in soil. So going back to the azomite, heavy minerals, heavy metals. This is one of those other products that can lock it up so it can't be taken up by the plant. So on top of gypsum kind of helping the plant with the detox of these heavy metals, this kind of locks some of it up. The humic acid locks it up so the plant can't take it up. So when I'm using trace minerals that are sometimes heavier or hit, have higher doses of heavy metals, that's one that I can actually use to block it out. That's what's nice about, um, cause it does, the chelation's a multivalent ion with the cation exchange, it's another one of those cation exchanges that it can chelate and change some of the multivalent bonds, ion bonds, and help with different plants to chelate different nutrients or to lock things out. In more simpler terms, the way I was explained to it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this one, the chelation is kind of like putting nutrients into like an envelope, right? And, 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 and making it more available for uptake. Is it? Yes, in, in, in a sense. So certain nutrients come in different forms that are not available. So say you have calcium or um, here's a great one, iron. If you have iron in your soil, a lot of people are like, oh, it's a heavy metal. Your plant's going to uptake it. Well, not necessarily. If it's not chelated to an available form the plant can take up, it's not gonna use it, even though it's in the soil. And that's what a lot of chelation is about, making different nutrients available in a different form than what they are. All right, BioLive. Talk to us about that. Down to Earth BioLive is the one that I believe you use. It is. Um, they also have a BioFish and BioThrive, I think. There's a couple different in their bio lines. But what it is is a different blend of multiple down to earth amendments from kelp to uh, soybean mill to gypsum. So it's a variety of all these ingredients in one. But what they added was beneficial fungi and bacteria, both endo, ecto, mycorrhizal, fungi. Um, there's several different strands of bacteria, some of them uh, the bacillus, if I recall. Um, but that's what I use it for is to get those endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungi in there and not just the arbuscule uh, fungi because there's several different ones that come from different nutrient lines um, that all of, not all of them are the same type of fungi or mycorrhizal fungi. So I'm trying to get, once again, a biodiversity, just like my nutrients, I'm trying to do the same thing in my soil. So that bio 
line really helps with what I'm doing in the soil and the soil biology. Because a lot of, like what we're talking about today, we haven't really gone into some of the soil biology parts of it. But some of these other amendments also really help with what we're trying to do with not just the diversity in soil amendments, but the diversity in the soil biology. Because that's, they go hand in hand. And you're talking about the microorganisms, right? When you're talking about the biology, right? Yep. The actual microorganisms. Every, everything in the soil, around the root zone, um, that's in the top couple inches of your soil where everything kind of breaks all the nutrients down and that's where your plants kind of get their roots to these areas to create exudates for these to do that symbiotic exchange of nutrients to sugars and carbs and and then for the the bio live i'm looking at it right now it's a 542 npk so would you say that this is more beneficial in um, just in veg or can this be used in flour as well you could use it in flour um it being higher in nitrogen is not an issue. Plants are still looking to take up nitrogen in flower cycle. They're not using as much, but they're, yet they're still using nitrogen to help development. And so using that would not be an issue on either veg or flower. I use it in both. The other part using it in, vet or in flower would be the beneficial bacteria and fungi. Because if you're an indoor cultivator, re-inoculating the soil every so often to make sure that the species are there, that the plants, looking for certain ones for certain nutrients to take up. So that's what part of that diversity is. So if they're dying off, you're just trying to you know, re-inoculate and get them back into the soil at that time. All right, let's switch it up to next one, Bokashi. Talk to us about that. I actually just got some Bokashi, using it for the first time. Yeah. I got the Grokashi. It's called Grokashi. That's the brand, I guess. Got it from Build the Soil and started using it. Um, just sprinkled it like two days ago. So talk to us about that. Um, well, it depends. There's several different brands on the market, several different companies. Some of it is just a wheat brand, oat brand, Bokashi. Some of it... Uh, has rice holes. Some of it has um, biochar mixed in with it. So it just depends on the companies that you're getting it from. Um, like Elevate Organics is one that does some rice holes and biochar. Um, Build a Soil, they have one that has rice holes in a wheat brand, I believe, that even if you had Bakashi or if you had compost at home, you can throw it on and create your own bakashi. So what bakashi is, is like three to four strains of anaerobic bacteria. Most people think anaerobic bacteria is bad, but these are the ones that are actually beneficial and good for the soil. They help different functions within the plant. Um, they help break down different organic matter and different amendments that the plant really enjoy. Um, so these three or four strands are like yeast, lactose bacillus, and then like a purple non-sulfur are like what's commonly found in the, what Bakashi is. And all it's really doing is helping get fungal communities are, because Bakashi is supposed to help build fungal communities, but it's weird because it's an anaerobic bacteria. But to me, it's the way it breaks down everything in the soil that the fungal communities then want to come in and start helping. It's kind of like, it's weird because some of these fungal bio and bacteria communities really work symbiotically. And you'll find communities and understand that like some are bad, like different anaerobic bacteria can be bad and harmful to the soil. And that's where a lot of aerobic uh, biology help go in the soil, kind of get rid of the bad pathogens, the anaerobic. If your soil is getting more oxygen to it, will help get rid of a lot of the bad pathogens in there. 
And that's where understanding the difference between like these are beneficial anaerobic as versus the bad anaerobic bacteria. That makes sense. And then one thing about uh, Bokashi is like really it, it creates that white mycelium layer right across the soil, which is pretty cool. I have a lot of people hit me up to like, what is this? You know, they all panic mode. It's actually a good thing to see that mycelium layer uh, across. Um, and that's what's really helping that break down, especially when you have it like when you top dress it, right, and have it over those nutrients that you maybe just top dress. That's probably right. one of the more beneficial ways to do it, right? It would really help break things down a little bit quicker because that's what Bakashi is really used for is for composting, breaking down organic matter. That's where you can create your own Bakashi at home with a couple different ingredients like blackstrap molasses, some oat or wheat brand or rice holes, and then some EM1. And you can create your own Bakashi. Or you can get Bakashi and sprinkle it on your compost and let it start breaking it down. And if you really went and got some yeast and some brown sugar, molasses, and you sprinkle that on compost, it would start breaking it down as well because yeast is part of what Bakashi is. So it's really interesting how you can create your own bakashi if you really wanted to or get it started breaking down your compost from these other like uh, companies out there. That is pretty interesting. It makes growing fun too, doing, trying out new things like that. Um, looking at the grokashi um, directions right now, I'll just read it off. So it says it can be used as a soil conditioner. 1% to 2% of total soil volume is what it says. We could use it as a top dresses, which is what I did. A third cup per square foot every two weeks is what they recommend. And then as a soil drench, it says use a third cup per gallon of clean water or nutrient solution. And then let it sit for 24 to 48 hours, stir in a tablespoon per gallon of blackstrap molasses, that's the food source, and then uh, strain to use. So just a uh, couple different ways to, to use Bokashi. So yeah, and that's what's so interesting is because it's so versatile on using it for nutrients um, to feed your plant with, to break down compost or get a compost pile going so you can use a compost to then feed your plants. So it's, it's really nice. It's very beneficial. Um, a lot of people, that's one of them that a lot of people don't know about and kind of overlook. And a lot of growers are really interested in like getting these communities these fungal communities to the plants and that's kind of what this Bakashi will do is help with the bacteria bring these fungal communities. So we went over 10 different uh, amendments there and um, you know when I first started getting to organics one of the things is that it can be overwhelming right you've got all these we, we just scratched the surface today we went over 10 and there's so many more beyond that you know kelp meal alfalfa meal insect frass uh, blood meal I got a cheat sheet here uh, feather meal, biochar, so we could go on and on. We could have a part two. If you guys want a part two. There could even be a part below. three because there's yeah. really so many because then you have the fish and the hydrolyzed fish and the fish meal and right there's three different ones. And that's, yep. that's what's so interesting is I literally have a tote full of probably 20 different products that I use. And everybody's like, that's a lot. But I'm looking at it as I don't know what my plant needs. And all of them work differently for my plant and the soil biology. And that's all I can do as a home cultivator, as growing my own fruits and vegetables, is try to give the plants everything available that they can use for nutrient uptake or nutrients in any form that I can find that's dry and organic. Because I don't like bottle nutrients. I prefer not to use them. They have shelf lives. Most of these dry organic amendments don't really have a shelf life. They're good until they get decomposed or broken down. So that's why I really enjoy using like the down to earth amendments because they're one of them that's pretty consistent of their product and where I can find them as versus some of these other companies. And their box is environmentally friendly, right? It breaks down. <laughs> breaks down. Even says compost on the compost, back of it. Yep. Use the box for compost. Yes. So. 
So <laughs> I have a big compost pile that I have all kinds of boxes that I've thrown in from making all these different soil amendments over the last couple of years. And it's, they break down pretty quickly, surprisingly. So all that being said, what advice do you have for somebody who is probably new, just getting their feet wet with organics and stuff? What, what advice would you have for them? Keep it simple. So the KISS method. Look for a couple things that you want to try. Um, I would recommend some, like some BioLive, one of those lines. Um, maybe um, you know a little bit of rock phosphate for the trace nutrients, um, either some gypsum or some dolomite lime just for the calcium, magnesium, sulfur to them. Um, um, and here's what's so nice about some of this down to earth. Some of it's pretty inexpensive and it's starting to get a little bit more expensive. Boxes, I can find gypsum for just about six bucks, but some of these other amendments are around 20 bucks for a five pound box. Um, you can get them in 30, 40 pound, 50 pound bags if you want a larger quantity. But to me, it's still relatively inexpensive where I can go get three or four items just to get started and mix them in a soil mix or make a tea with them and even do a foliar application with the solubility of some of this. That's another application that you can do on a lot of this. So taking them, you know, as a newbie, keeping it simple, I can grab a couple boxes of a couple ingredients that have some beneficial biology and some good nutrients and start with that. I think that's really good advice. That's one way to not get overwhelmed with everything that's going on is just start with one yeah, and get another one and kind of do your individual research and apply it as you feel best that you've done your research on and, and go from there. So I think that's great, great advice. And that's like me. I've worked over the years where I have 20 boxes. I don't use them all at one time because things change during my cycles of what I'm feeding them. But that's the whole point is I have what I need available um, for my plants and it takes time to build it because it didn't just happen overnight. I don't, the whole product line, if you had to go out and purchase the down to earth whole product line, you would probably spend $1,500 to $2,000. That's expensive. Can't, not everybody can afford to do that. So that's where a box here, a box there, and you're only putting a couple tablespoons here, a couple tablespoons there, it's going to last you a while. Most of my boxes, unless I literally have to make a whole new super soil recipe, I don't use my, it may take me six months to get through my box or longer. It may take me a year on some of them. The only time I use a large dose of the dry organic amendments is when I make a large tea or do super soil amending. And that's it. Bottled nutrients, we talked about that shelf life. You go buy a bottle, it's gotta be used by X amount of time, and if it's not, it's no good. I That can sit around for a year and I'll be good. Definitely a big benefit there, for sure. All right, so how can the listeners find you? And what do you got upcoming in the future? Well, um, we've got quite a bit going on. Um, We'll start off, you can find me on YouTube, Medically Fit. About 18,000 people follow me now. It's been a slow progression on educating people um, on the channel. Um, I've got a lot of great playlists on the soil amendments where I kind of talk a little bit more on some of them on there. As well as you can find me on Instagram or Cannabis. If you need to reach out to me and you want to message me, best place I talk to people and chat with people is on Instagram. It's easier for me to find messages there than it is through YouTube or anything else. So, uh, You might want to take that back because you're going to get flooded. That, <laughs> you're going to get flooded with questions, I'm sure. That's okay because I try yeah. to answer most people's questions and help most people out that I can. Um, it may take me a while to see because Instagram, if – we're not following each other. I have to allow their requests to come through. And so sometimes it takes me a while to see some of my messages. But I usually try to help quite a bit of people out that want a little bit more information. 
try to at least point them in directions so they can find some of the information. Um, that's what the channel is really for, is to try to point people in the direction of where to find some of this information. Absolutely. And you've done a great job over the years providing that information. And I thank you for your efforts there. Um, I'll link Medically Fit's channel down in the description section below so you can click on it. Uh, I'm on his channel right now. I'll also link that Nutrient T video that uh, I spoke about in the description section. And then if you look at his playlist, like he said, I mean, he's got one on horticulture, botany, and plant physiology. He's got a playlist for soil amendments. He's got one for understanding the benefits of cannabinoids. So he's got a lot of um, uh, educational information. A lot. To Over the years, it's just building and compiling all these different videos I found and watched over the years. And just to have, have somewhere people can go and find some of that information. Or if somebody asks, I can try to go to one of those and pull it up and send it to them. So it's always nice having a place you can find references. All right, Medically Fit. Thank you so much for coming on to the channel today. Any final words? Um, just do your research. Most of, like, my job is to turn you guys on to the information. Your job from that point on is to do research and find out. And the only way to grow the best plants you can is to do it yourself. Finding what works for you. It works different for everybody else. Not everybody, you know, like, you have soil growers hydro growers, aquaponic growers. Everybody has their niche. Find what works for you. Don't be afraid to try something different either because like you, it took you a little while and a little pushing to try some organics and what happened? You finally tried it after a while. And I even sent you some of these videos we're talking about over the oh, years. Yeah. Just yep. here, check this out. Here, check that out. I appreciate that. Definitely appreciate uh, you pushing me to wean my way off the bottles. <laughs> you know, and it just takes people sharing the right information and people willing to listen. Because you can lead a horse of water, but you can't make him drink. I can provide all the information to my listeners, but I can't force them to read it or watch it. Makes sense. All right, Med Medically Fit, I will let you go. Thanks again, and uh, have a good one. You too, and we'll hope to see you all again. Thank you.